Good morning. I'm Mary Mundinger. And for 25 years, I was dean of the Columbia University School of Nursing. And I had a fabulous faculty that led me to take on a lot of innovation. And although our first speaker says it should happen fast, a lot of what we did took almost 25 years. Um, I'm now the Edward M. Kennedy Professor of Health Policy and lets me focus more on the health policy aspects. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about five issues in primary care, what it is, why it's important, what's happening in the uh, regulatory world right now, uh, what the role of physicians is in primary care and has been, what the role of conventional nurse practitioners has been, what the role of the new doctor of nursing practice can be, and what the regulatory issues are, because all of these practice issues really rely on the authority to do what you can do. Primary care is important. It's the broad lens at which patients first enter the medical care system. They come with undifferentiated illnesses. Using the ER, as you really are well aware, are patients who don't have access to a physician or a nurse practitioner for that initial contact and who access the ER with symptoms. They don't go to the ER if they don't have symptoms. And so a lot of healthcare that is asymptomatic is not diagnosed and not treated in a timely manner. ERs are not a good primary care source. Individuals that have access to a variety of providers in, in the healthcare system have a good insurance plan and have a chronic illness may begin to get their primary care from their specialist. Those who've had a heart attack, may get their overall care from a cardiologist. Someone who has diabetes might be seeing an endocrinologist that is providing the services of primary care. But that lens is narrow. It, it, the cardiologist understands cardiovascular disease. The endocrinologist is great for diabetic management. But the primary care provider has a much broader scope, a wider lens, is going to look for things and look for nuances that specialists are not trained to do and aren't doing in their practice because they're overwhelmed with the specialty care they're required to do. Right now, we have had a primary care deficit, if you will, access to primary care providers for decades. The Affordable Care Act is going to increase that demand. We have relied on physicians to either provide primary care or be the team leader in primary care. And what our ill-informed policy world has done in the last few years is to dis decide that if you don't have enough physicians who can do the actual primary care interventions with patients, we're going to make them heads of teams so that they can oversee others who provide primary care. And those others are usually nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. Now, physicians are fleeing primary care for a lot of reasons. The status isn't as great as those who enter specialties. Certainly, the salaries and reimbursement aren't as great. And the content's tough. It's a 24-7 job. People come up with symptoms in the middle of the night. They come up with symptoms on Saturday mornings. And they don't, physicians in primary care don't find that that content, which is primarily about 75% is chronic illness or psych mental health problems, Many going into medical specialties see primary care as not providing status, good hours, exciting content, or good reimbursement. So the policymakers, instead of taking their lens and seeing if there's another resource we might look at, is trying to throw money at medical students or residents to stay in primary care. They'll pay them more per encounter, they'll reduce their debts. But you know, if you're a young, promising, physician and you have choices, those interim little ticks to your payment or reducing your debt isn't going isn't to do it. We've had nurse practitioners in primary care for 50 years. Next year is the 50 year anniversary of the beginning of the nurse practitioner movement. These are RNs who have special training in diagnostic and, and treatment modalities that are needed in office-based primary care. They don't do cross-site care. They're not following their patients into the ER or the hospital if they need care. They're not co-managing. They have an office-based capability that is very high quality. And it has been measured in thousands of studies and nurse practitioners always come out fine. But their scope is not as broad and clearly their depth isn't the same. 
they don't have the same medical depth of knowledge about disease, diagnostic therapies, they don't have all that. But what's good about nurses, and this is in general, they know when to call for help, and they know who to refer to, and part of that comes from who the people are who go into nursing. They go into care, to support, to advocate, to do, and their training, unlike medical training, begins by taking care of a whole array of patients at once. I don't mean sequentially. I mean you show up at 7 o'clock in the hospital and you have 10 patients assigned to you all day long. You have to figure out which one do I go to now, which one do I have to go back to every eight minutes. When all lights are on, which light do I answer, knowing what the potential vulnerabilities are for each patient. It's a whole different perspective. In nursing, unlike almost any other health profession, has long encounters with their patients. They may be with that same group of patients 8 or 12 hours. That means they pick up intimate nuances of how the patient's responding to therapy, whether they believe in the therapy, whether they're experiencing side effects that may come and go and aren't apparent during the few minute visit that their physician is there, they have a picture of how that patient is functioning all day long. They bring that intimacy of observation with them when they become primary care nurse practitioners. So they have a very different lens that they're looking through than a physician may be in providing primary care. But their scope and depth is less and so we determined at Columbia that we would do something about upgrading nurse practitioners' scope and depth of medical knowledge to see if we could bring nursing to the level where they would be a full complement to primary care instead of having a physician. So the first thing we did was in 1993, very close to that time, Presbyterian Hospital was determining they needed a new mainframe building. Most medical center hospitals were doing that during the 90s. It was part of the way to become more competitive. And Bill Speck, who was president of Presbyterian at that point, went to the New York State uh, Mortgage Authority to get a preferred mortgage. And like our medical center, like all others, uh, tend to be in underserved areas. New York State took a good look at where Presbyterian was and said there are thousands of Dominican Republic immigrants who don't have access to health care and in order to get the mortgage we want you to put together some new primary care sites to care for these families. Bill Speck, who's a pediatrician, thought that was a great idea. Uh, went to the medical school who said we think it's a great idea too but we don't have any primary care physicians. Uh, the few we have are fully engaged, sorry we can't help you. A few years before, because the nursing school was in great financial straits, we had determined that our faculty should spend part of their time and get part of their salary from practice. We thought it would increase their practice competency, would be a draw for nursing students coming here, that their faculty were actually seeing patients on a daily basis, not 10 years ago. And so we had faculty interspersed all over the medical center in practice, and physicians had learned to rely on them and revere their care. So Bill Speck came to me and he said, how about we put your nurse practitioners in these new practices? And they could run the practice. And I said, that sounds like a great idea, but we have a couple of things we need to think about. My faculty are already in practices they love. I'm not going to just extract them and say, we're going to put you in a new primary care practice. We have to do something unique. A randomized trial has never been done comparing nurse practitioners and physicians in practice. This is an unusually good opportunity for us to do that. New practices, you're going to hire, you're also going to hire one or two new physicians to do primary care, but they weren't going to have all physicians. It's going to be part nurse practitioner faculty, part physicians, new to the practice, undifferentiated patients, randomized, I hoped, from the hospital ER. They'd be undifferentiated. Anybody who came to the ER, didn't have insurance, would be enrolled in Medicaid, and randomized either to the physician practice or the nurse practitioner practice. Bill Speck said fine. Uh, Herb Pardis went along with this. Mike Weisfeld, who was chief of medicine, uh, championed it. And we went to, the, uh, went to the medical board and they thought it was a great idea. So we decided we would do this randomized trial as the new practices were developed. Uh, then I raised another question and I said, you know, we're going to be 
comparing apples and apples if we can't increase what the nurse practitioner's scope of practice is. If they can't co-manage and admit their patients to the hospital and do all the things that the primary care physicians do, we're, we're going to end up with a flawed outcome of our randomized trial. So Mike Weisfeld, chair of medicine, decided that he would uh, talk to his uh, department, which he did, and he was able to get uh, informal mentoring for the 10 nurse practitioners that were going to be in the trial. Each one was kind of velcroed on to a medical resident. They went through all the training that the medical resident went through for the first nine months. And they learned how to do ER evaluations. They learned how to uh, co-manage patients in the hospital, how to call for help, how to evaluate lab and x-ray findings that they hadn't gotten in their conventional training, and essentially be, be much more able to be compared with the physicians in the trial. We had uh, 1,400 patients randomized from the ER at Presbyterian, we uh, concluded the trial after two years. There were no differences in anything. No differences in uh, utilization, prescriptions, and nurse practitioners in the ER can prescribe any medication a physician can. No difference in hospital length of stay, no difference in outcomes. And because they were Medicaid patients, we were able to get the Medicaid tapes from New York State and find out whether you know, did patients assigned to the nurses jump the system and go see a doctor on the side? You know, we were able to find out that we had a legitimate match, that the patients assigned to the nurses went to the nurses, and the patients assigned to the physicians went to, went to the physicians. The study was published as the lead author in the January uh, issue of JAMA in 2000. This led us to believe, hey, we may be onto something here. Maybe what our nurses learned could be standardized and formalized into a new degree, and we get the nurse practitioners around the country upgraded. So we did that, and we developed the nurse, doctor of nursing practice. We put together all the skills that our nurse practitioners had learned with the physicians, and we developed this new degree. We uh, got university approval, and the first uh, group graduated in 2005, and we launched ourselves on the market, and now almost every single nursing school that's in a university setting, over 300 now have a doctor of nursing practice degree less than 10 years later. So it is a, a huge, you know, huge launch of this new degree. But there was no way to check whether the standards that nurses, nursing schools were following were similar. Maybe some of the doctor of nursing practice degrees were just inked over master's level. How, how did anybody know? So we thought we have to go look further. We need to find a way to certify doctor of nursing practice students to see if they have actually have accomplished the same competencies. So luckily we got the National Board of Medical Examiners to develop an exam from the same pool of questions that go into the step three MD licensing exam. And they developed an exam which they publicly said tested the same competencies as physicians who pass their MD licensure exam. That's been out there since eight years ago. And those who finish, who complete the exam, are called diplomats in comprehensive care. Now, they don't have everything a physician in primary care has. I mean, a, a, a newly licensed MD isn't a primary care physician. But nonetheless, they have elicited a competency-based beginning in the same place medical students do going into primary care. And don't forget, they're nurses. So they bring those nuanced, observational, long-time views of how patients are doing. As public health nurses, they go in their patients' homes and they find out a medical prescription isn't enough. You've got to figure out if they have the financial, intellectual, other resources. Are they caring for other six family members? How are they going to take care of themselves? So we have a nurse with a 3D view of how patients function when they take on the doctor of nursing practice and become certified as DCCs. Our challenge today is to get the regulatory system to understand this. Only 20 states give nurse practitioners, including doctor of nursing practice practitioners, the authority to practice without physician oversight. If we continue to think as a public policy group that the only individuals who are capable of being full scope primary care providers are physicians, we're doomed. We have in this country a deficit right now of 46,000 specialist MDs. 
Why should we capture them and push them into primary care roles when we have another resource and we need them in specialty medicine? So join me in hoping this whole regulatory system wakes up and we can empower these DCCs to be our primary care workforce for the future. Thank you very much.